Hello, I'm Bill Whalen. I'm the Virginia Hobbs Carpenter Distinguished Policy Fellow in Journalism here at the Hoover Institution. And I'd like to welcome you back to the Hoover Book Club, where we bring Hoover fellows and friends together to discuss their writings. Our guest today is my colleague, Tim Kane. Tim is a Hoover Institution visiting fellow specializing in economics, immigration, and national security. He's also the author of a new book, The Immigrant Superpower, How Brains, Brawn, and Bravery Made America Stronger. Tim, it's great to see you. Congratulations on the book. Thanks, Bill. Great to see you. So let's begin today with a uh, very timely tie into immigration in your book, and that would be um, the crisis in Ukraine. Uh, and I'm interested in this regard, Tim. Um, the, the Ukrainian situation takes on all kinds of aspects, obviously military, diplomatic, but also there's going to be an immigration angle here, uh, a migration crisis. Uh, it's certainly going to strike the European Union. I'm guessing, Tim, at some point you're going to see a drumbeat in Washington about helping Ukrainians come to America, which seems to be, Tim, is going to lead us right into the briar patch that we've had on immigration for the past three decades, which is a question of what? Who gets to come to America? Who gets priority? Who gets membership in the club? So walk us a, bit, a little bit through the dynamics of Ukraine, especially in terms of the issue of political refugees. Thanks, Bill. The first point I want to make in this book, and it's really different from other immigration books out there, is that this is a national security issue, and, and it's all almost always debated as, you know, in economic domestic policy, are immigrants stealing jobs? I deal with that. As you know, right. I'm an economist, but the centrality of our policy on immigration toward the world is, is all about national security concerns. Mm -hmm. LBJ, the reforms in 1965 were about how to use immigration, not, not as a weakness, but as a strength in the Cold War. And you may remember there was some complaint that Americans didn't care about Rwanda. And right. I think there's some validity to that. There was a genocide in Rwanda. Americans didn't get involved. Bill Clinton, when, when Europe said, you know, Bosnia is a Europe solution, Bill Clinton said there's, there's another genocide brewing happening. We did get involved. What's the difference? Right. The difference is that there's a, a huge number of Americans uh, from the Yugoslav republics, from Bosnia, from Croatia. Right. So there was a concern. There's literally familial relationships. Well, Bill, there's over 1 million Ukrainian Americans that go all the way back to the first uh, founding at Jamestown. Mm -hmm. There was a Ukrainian immigrant that came to Jamestown in America. Right. And so there are deep roots here and deep connections uh, between the Ukraine and the United States, as well as Russia and the United States. So this is personal. And I think when we see um, families, relatives, and the suffering, it's, it's impossible for America to stay out and to see injustice happen in the world, for, for good or ill, right. right? And so, yeah, I don't think this is going to be able to be kept at arm's length by anyone in Washington, D.C. The way the system is set up, though, Tim, do political refugees always get top priority? Unfortunately, we've seen a really strange shift. I mean, the, the, the notion of uh, refugee treatment, mm -hmm. according to international law, really came in the wake of World War II, and right. the notion that victims of communism um, would be recognized. And then it, then it got broadened in the decades after that. Right. Um, but we've seen a bit of a perverse shift now where <clears throat> everyone's counted as a refugee, whether they're suffering from political violence or domestic violence. And there's been a lot of pushback on that, that I agree with. I think Ion Hirsi Ali, our colleague at Hoover, has said that the blurring of definition of a refugee isn't helpful right. because it should be saved for situations like this. Mm -hmm. And I'm pretty confident the Biden administration will, and they certainly should, be calling for a, a, a ridiculously large increase in welcoming refugees from this Ukraine crisis. Support for Poland and the other nations bordering the Ukraine, because there will be a refugee crisis. These right. are not people that are just looking for jobs or a better life. Their homes are being bombed. So yeah, immigration now plays a key role in how we deal with uh, foreign aggressors, um, but also in how we strengthen our own national security. If we are involved, Bill, and this is, this is maybe you know make long-winded answer, I apologize. If the United States does get involved in Ukraine, we have linguistic expertise and geographic expertise of people who have that language in their homes here in the US. So it gives us an advantage in being engaged in a way that other superpowers say couldn't. 
Right. I'd also uh, uh, add, Tim, that uh, there's a moral obligation here for America. That is, we try to present ourselves as a force for good versus a force for evil. If you want to view Putin that way, good means you welcome people into your country. Yeah. It, Condi Rice, our boss here, former Secretary of State, uh, widely perceived across the political spectrum as a sort of sage leader on these sort of issues, said this cannot stand for the Russian invasion. And so you know, this will be with us all year long. It will be with us next year. I, I'm glad that this book has come out in a, in a time where it's relevant, because anyone who thinks, you know, our foreign ties through immigration are just a domestic policy issue, they're, they're front and center today. And I think we will be involved. And it's because of those over a million Ukrainian Americans that are deeply concerned and rightfully so. And it does, Bill, I do think you, you brought up this moralistic good country, bad country, Mm -hmm. um, I don't think people should run away from that. Uh, America has got a pretty proud heritage on the world stage, at least, of feeling a moral rightness to what we do to right. try to make the world a better place. And I think our founding documents that say we recognize the equality of, of all men, right, which it, that was the original language, but all men and women, all humans should be treated equally and are created equally, recognized as equals in the eyes of God. That makes it impossible for us to turn a blind eye to this kind of suffering. I want to get into the uh, uh, crux of your book, Tim, which is that immigration is tied into both America's uh, economic power, but also military strength and innovation. But first, let's talk a bit about how you came to embrace immigration as an issue. You're an economist by training, so so explain the journey to immigration. Well, it, it happened because of my experience, Bill, in the in the U.S. military. I was in the Air Force, uh, was based stationed in first Korea and then Japan and our bases there and our alliances with Korea and Japan mattered a great deal. But I recognized then how many Korean Americans and Japanese Americans I was working with in the military and I was in the intelligence community. And I, I just saw and recognized that the, those relationships, those immigrant strengthened relationships were so essential in helping preserve peace. Um, so it, it kind of tied together. When I came to Hoover, this really wasn't my priority. I was thinking about budget issues. Um, I was thinking about some just flat out military leadership, talent management issues. Mm -hmm. And yet I was asked to co-chair the immigration task force with Eddie Lazier. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I got deeper and deeper and, and I really wanted to write a book on this. I've been thinking so much about it for so long. And there's a, there's a point that's forgotten, which is you know, how we won the Cold War. You remember that book, uh, Bill, or that phrase, The Ugly American? Yes. That was a book that was written as a critique because American immigration policy was so cold. Mm -hmm. we, we still had this hangover from the 1920s legislation with ethnic quotas, and it was used against us by the Soviets. And so JFK and LBJ pointed to that book. President Kennedy actually bought a copy of The Ugly American and gave it to every sitting fellow senator before he was elected to the White House, said, if we want to win the Cold War, we need to see immigration as a key part in who we are as a people and our identity as a foreign policy issue. I haven't, I haven't seen that. I haven't heard that anywhere else. And I thought that I needed to write this book to bring back that, uh, that notion. Okay, let's uh, go through these one by one. Uh, immigration is a ties, first of all, to America's economic strength. Please explain. So, if we had uh, gone back to say the year 1820, which is really when the, the waves from Europe started, initially with the, the Irish, um, and then all through that century ending with the pogroms against Jews in, in Russia and elsewhere in Eastern Europe who came to America, Italians who came in waves to America, there was resistance, there made this resistance to all of these waves of immigration, but the, the welcoming nature was overwhelming to the, the nativism. I think that's still true today. But I did a little thought experiment in the book. What if we just didn't have those immigrants? What if uh, the candidate for president in 1816, Rufus King, what if he'd won? And he had the notion that uh, all these Irish are undesirables and they really shouldn't be here. Well, you know, my family wouldn't have made it in. Right. But our population bill, the US population in World War II, would have been smaller than Nazi Germany's. Mm -hmm. You can't be a superpower with a small population. 
And in fact, it's probably hurt our power that the restrictions against China starting in 1882, they just this ugly racist block of Asian immigrants uh, across the board, I think really did hurt our power. But the fact that we were welcoming for so long was key. So that's that's thing number one is just broad. Uh, right. Thing number two is brains, just the amount of um, Nobel prizes that are won by immigrants, the innovations. And the fact is America has been, invented so much of modern technology from the airplane right. to, uh, you know, to, to other weaponry, but advanced technology, the internet, Yahoo, Google, these are companies founded by immigrants. Um, Elon Musk, immigrant, right? Battery technology and electric cars. So there's that aspect of them, immigrant Americans adding. But I think the most fascinating part is the uh, bravery. Mm-hmm. I was really surprised when I watched just, just some Hollywood movies, uh, the Band of Brothers in particular, that miniseries. And it struck me, Perkani, Luz, Garnier, uh, Sobolewski. Right. These are real soldiers in World War II for the United States. And they were all second generation immigrants. Most of them, their parents didn't speak English. Mm-hmm. Right. So the, the patriotism and the willingness to serve in the military by foreign born first and second generations far outpaces um, right. native born Americans like, like you and I. So, and, and then the medals of honor, that have been won, roughly half of the medals of honor ever awarded were to first or second generation immigrants. So they don't just serve as a way to get a leg up. These immigrants, friends of mine like France Hong, um, refugee from Vietnam, volunteer to go into harm's way to spread this idea of America and, and equality for all. So those three factors are really key to making us stronger. Mm-hmm. Uh, if you're going to talk economics, Tim, it's going to lead us to a conversation about skilled versus unskilled immigrants. And here it's exceedingly complicated. Yes, you want to bring in the next Elon Musk. You want to bring in the next immigrant who will design some super chip. Right. And right. you and I are talking from California where unskilled immigration is key to doing a lot of unglamorous work, cleaning homes and kicking hotels up and running and washing dishes and restaurants and so forth. So how do you strike the balance between the two? So you could you could say, yeah, let's bring in the um, uh, not the Eisenhowers, the uh, Einsteins. Right. Of course, we all want the Einsteins. But what about the Oppenheimers? Right. Because Robert Oppenheimer was also working on nuclear power or the nuclear bomb, the Manhattan Project. But his father came and, and was a poor refugee, essentially, and right. didn't have a lot of skills. And so, you know, France Hong's another example. The, the amount of refugees who come whose parents maybe uh, don't have a lot of education but have these values of, of hard work and love of country, frankly, and right. belief in the American dream. When I look across our political commentary today in the American dream, it's actually, I think, considered a microaggression to use that phrase in some places. Mm-hmm. But it's not in you know, the poor countries of Africa and in Iran and in Ukraine who think the American dream's real and come here and make it real. So their children are often some of the, the highest performing productive people. And let's point to Sergey Brin. I believe uh, Sergey came here when he was six. Or, or, or Mos- born in Moscow. Right. Yeah. Right. So he's an example. Another example of the American success story would be Steve Jobs, Tim, because his father was um, uh, born in Syria, I believe. So another right. immigrant success story. Um, but as we look at this, though, here's the question moving forward. So let's talk about innovation for a second. Would it make sense right now for the United States government to be looking at citizens of Taiwan? And if not dangling citizenship, maybe talking about some sort of visa and immigrant for one simple reason. They're under the gun. China is looking at them and licking its chops. And what do we know about Taiwan? It produces an incredible amount of chips. So you could argue that here's an intelligent base that perhaps you could move to the United States. Can immigration be that real politique, Tim? I think I think it can, and I think it should be. So I do address this in the book, Bill, but I think it's time to really be, it's time for an evolutionary step forward in American policy toward refugees. Right. And there's a second theme that I mentioned in the book, which is it's time to shift to standards-based immigration. We're really stuck in this notion of quotas, right? There, right. there could be 10,000 people from here and 5,000 people from that country or or, and then an overall cap as well. I mean, the cap's really high. The US right. issues 1 million legal green cards for, for legal immigrants every year. I think that's great, mm-hmm. but, but what if we just based it on standards? So if you have an engineering degree, um, 
and you'd like to come to the U.S., you're you're welcome to. Why would we put a cap on that? Right. That's a huge national. But but I think when it comes to refugee policy, it may be time for the State Department to designate which countries are either failed states or politically repressive. So let's right. call them the refugee countries. And if you are on that list, if you are, let's say, a Nazi Germany, which would be recognized as a politically repressive state, that ends all trade agreements. It ends, certainly ends foreign aid. You know, right. So should the United States still be in the business of sending developmental aid to mm -hmm. China to build bridges and dams when right. we know there are you know, camps for Uyghurs, uh, re-education camps, and, and the sorts of violence that are being done there? So maybe places like Venezuela, China, Syria, um, Afghanistan now, and it right. looks like, you know, I don't know if you'd say Ukraine is, is in this situation, but either countries that are being attacked or that have a politically repressive dictator would be recognized. And those are the only countries right. that we would recognize refugees from. Uh, other immigrants would come in, you know, through familial relationships or as economic migrants, that's fine. But I think we need to really redefine and, and evolve forward the, the notion of a refugee in a way that can be used to shame some of the bad behavior that really needs to be shamed. Right. Let's talk about one other change, perhaps, Tim. Uh, and this is one that interested me, given that you and I work on the campus of Stanford University. Newcomers to Stanford are always surprised by three things. Number one, how great the weather is. Uh, secondly, just how much space there is. It's the second most acres per student in America, I believe. And then thirdly, preponderance of Asian students on campus. And this is not said as a racist trope or anything. It's the fact is one thing that works to Stanford's advantage. It has a lot of students coming from the other side of the Pacific Rim. But the way the system works, Tim, is you you get a student visa, you study, then you're supposed to go back home. Should right. we look at that policy, Tim, and perhaps address it saying that come to study in America, and hey, why don't you think about sticking around? It's sort of crazy that yeah. there's somebody who uh, comes here, bright-eyed, brilliant, 18-year-old woman at Stanford, gets a computer science degree. The day of graduation, U.S. policy is go home. Off, off you go and try to, you know, try to beat us at, at what you're doing. And she says, hey, I like it here. Could I stay? Imagine right. if we treated, you know, the kids from Florida that way. Like, hey, you got your degree here in California. Go right. home. No, we, we that is not that is a human capital asset. And I would rather have, just to be you know, blunt about it, if there's a Chinese student immigrant who's a computer scientist, I would rather her stay here in this country and help build up our economy and our technological advantage than go home and build the AI systems of China um, to Beijing's advantage. So it's a clear national security issue that we're failing at. Right. And we, we had a huge number. Ben Wadalski writes this great book about this, The Great Brain Race. And the US had a huge advantage in foreign students we were the superpower of foreign students wanting to come to a country. They wanted to come to the United States. Mm -hmm. And our advantage has essentially been cut in half. I don't have the raw statistics with me, but it may have been something like 20% of the world's students were here, mm -hmm. international students, now it's just 10. Raw numbers, it's still pretty high. The percentage we've given up, you know, one, a lot of money because that's a big industry. And two, the brain power race, I wouldn't say we're losing, but we could have been completely dominant in it, and now we're just sort of meandering along. That, that's not acceptable if you realize we're still in a hostile world where brain power matters. Let me read to you, Tim, an immigration reform proposal uh, offered once by a president. And here's what the plan included. It first of all addressed border security. It cracked down on employers who hire undocumented uh, residents. And then it tried to thread the needle. And, and here's actually the verbiage of the immigration plan. Quote, in addition to paying a meaningful penalty, undocumented workers must learn English, pay their taxes, pass a background check, and hold a job for a number of years before they will be eligible to be considered for legalized status. Uh, the author of that plan was George W. Bush. I would argue, Tim, the timing could not have been worse for this proposal because he offered it in 2007, right after he had lost Congress and he was struggling with uh, unpopular wars and the economy started to go south. But I read that plan and it makes sense on a lot of levels. Although we'll point out one thing, though, that he was really did try to, dock, to you know, sort of dance around the pathway to citizenship question. But here you have kind of a balance on the part of the Republican president. George Bush and his father, George H.W. Bush, right. were two of the greatest presidents we've had in terms of pro-immigration policy. 
Right. You explained this in the book. What did what did H.W. do? But there was an Immigration Act in 1990 right. uh, that essentially doubled the green cards that were issued every year mm -hmm. and introduced a new green card category called the diversity visa. Because there were some countries, mainly in Africa, that didn't have the family ties, which is right. the main channel. Um, and so they were sort of left out. And that really wasn't fair. Um, I don't think it was necessarily racist, but it was George Bush recognized all these people that wanted to come didn't have a way in and, and had a lot of value to offer. Eddie Lazier, one of his great papers uh, before he passed was about how the Nigerian immigrants, uh, just for example, who tend to come to the United States are some of the most talented Nigerians. So they're adding value, but there wasn't an avenue for them to come. And so George Bush introduced this diversity visa in 1990. I liken what he did to the Louisiana Purchase, right? It's, it doubled the size of the country geographically. That was Thomas Jefferson. George Bush doubled the scale of intake of immigrants that helped our, get our economy stronger for the reasons we talked about before. And his son, President Bush, uh, George W. Bush, um, wanted to do something similar and, and engage in what's called comprehensive immigration reform. I was part of that. The Bush White House asked me to tour the country and help sell that idea, you know, and have town halls and talk about what was involved and we did. And it just blew up in our face. Um, and sadly, that's when the partisanship in DC took over. At the time, I was angry at Nancy Pelosi because Pelosi and a lot of other Democrats didn't want a Republican president to get a pro-immigration piece of legislation passed. So we see that now, a lot of jockeying, poison pills, and I think, you know, as policy guys, you and I, we need to be honest, big comprehensive pieces of legislation aren't done in America in a bipartisan fashion anymore. And so I think they're chasing some fool's gold. And I, I propose an alternative strategy in the book. Tim, I'd argue that there are probably two windows in which a president can do immigration reform. Number one, he or she is elected by a very large number, a landslate, a mandate, and he or she also has a large number of fellow party members in Congress so that they can get their stuff through. This is Barack Obama in 2009. But Obama didn't go for immigration right away. He went for what? Healthcare reform. That's where he that's where he dedicated his first two years in office. The other window for this, Tim, would be a sitting president who is on the run and he has just lost Congress and sees the writing on the wall unless he does something dramatic. This would have been Bill Clinton in 1995, but for reasons I'll never understand, I probably need to ask him if I see him. Newt Gingrich didn't want to go down this road either. Um, how did Ronald Reagan manage to pull off immigration reform? Because he did it at the end of his second term when he had lost control of, of the Senate and, and thus had lost complete control of Congress, yet he somehow managed to strike a deal with the Democratic Congress. I think when, when uh, a lot of Americans voted for uh, Joe Biden, they were hoping to get a return to the politics of Bill Clinton passing welfare reform or yep. George Bush, no child left behind. Remember that image of Ted Kennedy at the White House, arm in arm with right. the president? That, that true nature of bipartisanship where you don't just reach out to um, the centrists in your party, like, like Joe Manchin say. If President right. Biden would have Joe Manchin to the White House and say, what can we do? Okay, let's do that. Right. Instead, you see this um, politics now come from the extremes, where the extremes dictate essentially what legislation they want and then browbeat and try to humiliate anyone who doesn't go along, even members of their own party. George Bush, Bill Clinton, they brought, you know, their rivals in the other party and said, what can we do to work together? And right. so that was that was really a nice moment. It's funny, when you remember living through this time in the 90s and the early 2000s, I didn't think of it as a golden era of bipartisanship, but there were certainly um, notes uh, strong notes in, in the music of the time right. that were bipartisan notes. So that's what needs to be done. And on this issue, I don't think they can go big. Right. I think they have to go, president has to go small. But you know, one of the things I've noticed in watching history unfold in my lifetime is big things get done often when people are distracted. So, you know, Ukraine's happening. It's going to dominate the news this year. There's a perfect opportunity to essentially go small on refugee policy, make a fundamental shift, but in a way that's relevant to what's happening in the Ukraine that would completely reshape our refugee policy. Um, and so, you know, no child left behind. 
it was happening, I, th I think that might have been pre 9-11, mm -hmm. but um, it wasn't considered the big issue of the day. Right. Um, certainly the 1990 reform that we talked about earlier, that wasn't the big, you know, nobody even knew we essentially did this Louisiana purchase of immigration policy in 1990 because they were focused on the Cold War ending and, you know, how do we help uh, restructure Europe? So right. I don't know, Bill, I think this is an actually a huge opportunity for the next three years um, and maybe you're right, maybe when you get a Republican Congress in to do some hawkish immigration reform that's focused on strengthening our security, and that is to welcome refugees from China and Russia in particular. It's worth thinking about if you figure that A, the Biden presidency is struggling, and B, the odds are he's going to lose the House and maybe the Senate as well uh, next year, which gets me into that scenario of a struggling presidency and, uh, and a resurgent Congress. Uh, but, you know, a phrase which comes to mind here, Tim, is hot button. And that immigration has been called a hot button issue. I've been in California since 1994, yeah. and I yeah. worked for Pete Wilson, and that was year in Proposition 187 was passed, and that was kind of the beginning of immigration as a quote unquote wedge issue, hot button issue, whatever you want to call it. But you look at America right now, Tim, and yes, you mentioned Ukraine. What else are hot buttons? Um, the economy, inflation, you're an economist, you can appreciate this. And then thirdly, the issue of education, which we saw was potent in the Virginia governor's race, uh, was uh, potent in San Francisco, where three school board members just lost their jobs right. because of what they did during the pandemic. Um, but when Biden came to office, Tim, in his first six months, immigration was a hot button issue and the question of the border and what to do. So we've, kind, right. of forgotten, we've kind of forgotten about the border. Tim, what do we do about border security? Yeah, I would. I, there are hot button issues, and then there are wedge issues, right? So if, right. You, if you get the, both of those together, yeah. But my point is, my point is, we've kind of forgotten about what is going on, you know, along the southern border. Uh, Kamala Harris has been in Europe and not down on the Rio Grande. But what yeah. what is an effective strategy for the United States in terms of? And this is really kind of a two pronged question. It's how to how to police the border properly, but then second, what to do about Central America. So we, we need to recognize this idea of root causes, which is taken on a life of its own. And it's just assumed that the root causes are on the supply side of right. people seeking asylum, right? So there's an increased right. violence in Central America, you know, the, the you know, weak economies um, in, in Central America, Honduras in particular. Um, those root causes are, are a bit of fiction, Bill. I mean, I, I wrote about this in a separate thing for Hoover and defining ideas certainly in the book, violence is down in every country in Central America since it peaked 10 years ago in 2012. I mean, homicide rates essentially cut in half in El Salvador, in Honduras. Uh, GDP per capita and, and median incomes have been rising um, for right. decades and decades. What's changed is not the supply side of, mm -hmm. of immigrants. Travel costs are cheaper, right? right. The, the, what used to be a trickle has become a pipeline, an actual railroad, um, where it's easier when these travel routes are established. They're corrupt and they're run by coyotes and they cost a lot of money, but they're 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 open um, railroads essentially. Uh, but what's really changed is the demand side. Like the receiving country in America, our policy is just this mishmash of perverse um, incentives that are telling people. And this happened. This started. I, I point the finger at President Obama and the DACA. Uh, executive action that said, well, you know, if you have a child in the U.S. who's undocumented, then you can stay, essentially. Mm -hmm. They will call them the dreamers. I'm very sympathetic to that. It just right. shouldn't have done by, been done by executive action without other safeguards. And the way it got translated all throughout Latin America was travel with a young child and you're let in free, which is de facto policy now. So until they can get that squared away, that that we'd have nearly, I think it was 2 million or 1.9 million um, apprehensions right. at the U.S.-Mexico border, that number is not going down, Bill. It's going to go up. And right. uh, I think it really is a, a bit of a black eye. And it leads to people saying, well, we need to have fewer refugees. No, we need to redefine what refugees are and give border agents the power to just say, no, you're, you're not a political refugee. We need to change this policy entirely. But that's going to involve getting the courts, not just the executive branch, the judicial branch has right. to revisit this and reconsider what they call the Flores Amendment that, that you know, children, you know, need to be separated or can't be separated. It's just a, it's a mess right now that would take longer to get into than this book review. But 
I think this may lead to a much bigger crisis next year and the year after that. And so it would it will rival what's happening with our the, the news headlines in Ukraine if that number goes up again in 2022. Yeah, you economists love supply and demand explanations. Uh, do, you, do you recall what uh, George Schultz's solution was to, uh, to the drug problem? Uh, I, of course I do. Yes. Well, Secretary Schultz and I were, were uh, had almost identical views on everything. I, I, he was one of my mentors and I looked up to him. Mm -hmm. Decriminalization and right. legalization, that this is, this is a medical issue, not a crime issue. In fact, if we treat it like a crime issue, it's going to lead to corruption and it's going to lead to innocent police officers being killed. So that's what we've seen. And, and I, I'm really happy to see that uh, we've moved in the direction that George Schultz foresaw. Right. Decades, when you and I were young kids, he was saying this. Right. Plus, he had the classic supply and demand explanation, Tim. Right. He said, look, if you decriminalize, in other words, if you if you, you know, allow to legally sell it, uh, you're going to create a market. The market's going to produce you know, less expensive drugs. You're going to take away the profitability for the criminal element. And so that's a Schultz explanation. <laughs> Bill, I'm going to pull out the chalkboard here and draw supply and demand curves as you keep this up. And I will prove to you that making drugs illegal just raises the profits for the drug lords. So, yeah, that this is this is a. Uh, an Econ 101 lesson, uh, but we can just leave it at that. Take my word for it. Let's go through the uh, Biden record on immigration quickly, Tim. I want you to give me just basically a yay or nay on these three bullet items. Number one, he's boosted refugee admissions. Yay or nay? Incomplete. Because Incomplete. It, Donald Trump brought them down year after year, lower and lower and lower. Mm -hmm. But the initial Biden response was to take refugee numbers up to 65,000 a year. They had been 125,000 and in some cases raised higher by previous presidents, 140,000 or more. Now is the time for President Biden to go way beyond the, the, the norm and do 150,000 or more and, and say these are set aside for people from Venezuela, people from uh, refugees from the Ukraine and uh, people in Hong Kong and Western China. Okay, item number two, he preserved deportation relief for unauthorized immigrants to who came to America as children. I, I don't know if I followed that bill. It's it's a mishmash. He's, he's maintained what are called, uh, President Biden's maintained Title 42 restrictions, right. which were a Trump era initiative. And that was based on COVID that you know potentially diseased immigrants can be blocked. It, it's an ugly history of saying that foreigners are diseased. This goes back thousands of years, but even in US history, I point out in the very, I think first line of the book that we see an echo today of what was happening 100 years ago. In 1921, there were restrictions put on in the wake of the Spanish flu. It just right. led to this you know, paranoia about foreigners bringing in diseases, even though we know the Spanish flu was misnamed. Right. Um, so yeah, COVID led to this notion that let's just block foreign travel which is a much bigger deal even than immigration, 181 million foreign travelers a year would come to the U.S. to go to Disneyland and be in business trips. But even our allied countries where they had widespread vaccine use were still blocked under President Biden. Recently, very recently, that's been relaxed. But you can see that snapping back. So no, I don't think all the restrictions at the border have been, have been overturned yet. Okay, now let's talk about the elephant in the room here. Uh, that's the president's plan to create an eight-year path uh, way to citizenship for about 10 and a half million undocumented immigrants. Tim, uh, also updating existing family-based immigration system and increasing the number of diversity of visas that you mentioned a minute ago. Um, eight-year pathway to citizenship. Does that make sense to you? I, I, no. <laughs> okay. Bill. But, the, but this is, this is the big issue at the end of the day. It's okay, you're going to allow people to, you allow people to come to your country, but, you know, the pot of gold at the end of the rainbow is citizenship. So yes. how do you award citizenship? Yeah. So, you know, let's let's talk um, political lingo. What is a dog whistle, Bill? Dog whistle is when a political party uses a certain type of language that sounds nice but means something else. OK, right. pathway to citizenship to Democrats means this is a humanitarian policy, but we're actually gonna allow a lot of people to come in, even if they came in illegally, and we're gonna give them a citizenship. Saying it's a pathway and they've gotta do these other things, you right. know, make the medicine go down. Mm -hmm. Republicans, and I pulled this with Doug Rivers, and David Brady. Right. 
pathway to citizenship hits Republican ears like amnesty. And it's just a non-starter to ask Republican members of the Congress and the Senate to, to pass legislation like that. Mm -hmm. So I, I get frustrated when I hear it because it means they're, they're using symbolism rather than doing anything substantive on legislation. Mm -hmm. So is there a better phrase of art to use here? Yeah, Le don't, don't offer a pathway to citizenship, offer legal status. Legal That's status. actually what the DACA, you know, the uh, executive action was. It's mm -hmm. you could have a three-year renewable legal status, meet behavior, right? And then while you're in the US with legal status, you can still apply for citizenship. You just don't get to jump to the front of the line. Yeah. So I, I think saying there's an implicit pathway, which is fair and normal, but the making an explicit pathway just for people who've broken the law it really doesn't square well, even with independent voters when it's explained. And frankly, a lot of Democratic voters don't like the idea of amnesty, but they've just been sort of conditioned that that's not what, what this is. Well, it, it strikes me, and I think it strikes a lot of uh, in Republican voters as that is an amnesty and they don't like it. All right, Tim, let's talk about grounds for becoming an American citizen. What three or four just must should be and should English proficiency be part of the conversation? Uh, here it gets complicated, Tim, because there are two ways to look at this. To succeed in America, you probably need to be able to speak English. Otherwise, you're really limiting yourself to one sector of the economy. On the other hand, if you say that you know you need to speak English, it's very easy to be cast as what you mentioned before, the ugly American. You're denying people their culture. So explain, Tim, what kind of the must should be for a citizenship besides the obvious things such as criminal background. Right. Well, so I would, first of all, let's distinguish entry requirements, which are a longstanding debate in U.S. history, you know, most active in the 1880s, 1890s, versus citizenship. Right. So I think we're on the right side of history and with the greatest presidents um, who said no to an English test or a literacy test. Right. Uh, there, there, were some, there were some tests for entry about disease that made sense. Um, if somebody was likely to become a public charge, a little bit more controversial, because I think refugees, a two-year-old kid from, from Vietnam or a one-year-old baby from Afghanistan, well, maybe, but then they end up, <clears throat> refugees end up adding tremendous value. But then on the notion of English, you know, I'm reminded of Bill Garnier, American soldier featured in the Band of Brothers, who right. said his mod didn't talk English, he talked Italian, right? So... No, it's, you can find some very patriotic Americans who don't speak English. That said, uh, I believe English should be the official language and declared the official language of the United States, because the fact is, we need to nudge and encourage everyone to, to speak the common tongue, which benefits those individuals. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so I think, though, let's turn back to your question. Yeah, you, you, have, you have candidate A and candidate B, they want to be citizens. How does A get priority over B? What makes A the stronger candidate? I, I think it's important to say, Bill, we do a lot right. Anytime mm -hmm. you hear a discussion about immigration, it's like, oh, this is wrong and this is broken. We could all agree it's broken. I don't agree it's broken. I think America's got a really good immigration system. Border security is an issue. But why is it that American immigrants, on average, express more patriotic responses than do American teenagers or even American adults. They believe in the Constitution more, 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 have a deeper understanding of First Amendment rights because they've come from oppressive places where that hasn't uh, been the norm. Right. So you, you find this really deep patriotism. And secondly, we've got an assimilation program. They mm -hmm. take an oath of citizenship. And I really worry that when all this notion of immigration is broken, let's fix it. I mean, frankly, I think liberals would say, oh, there's all this shame in American history. Let's not make immigrants learn it, right? right. No, it's working. Assimilation is a strength that the United States has that countries in Europe don't, that have a very transactional view of immigration, which I think is causing some real alienation problems and is a link to some of the terrorism we see in Europe that we don't see in immigrant communities in the United States. Let's now talk about two aspects of the Constitution, Tim, that I would argue are very outdated. 
uh, the first being Article 2, Section 1, and the idea that uh, the presidency is limited to only naturalized natural yeah. citizens, uh, and the second being the 14th Amendment and the idea of birthright citizenship. Uh, the former Article 2, Section 1, the founding fathers were worried about a president being a proxy of European power, so they wanted, by God, somebody born on uh -huh. American soil. The 14th Amendment is a response to slavery, how you bring African-American slaves into society. So that, I would argue that Tim are both outdated in this regard. First of all, the idea of birthright citizenship. Uh, here in California, there's been an underground economy for years, which is uh, women coming from China and giving birth in the U.S. so that their children become U.S. citizens. Right. But then secondly, naturalized born citizen, let's again put this in California terms, the young man or woman who is living in Orange County, um, and they came here from Vietnam in 1975, boat child, and they have lived in America for all but one year of their life, let's say, they are far more American than they probably are Vietnamese by this point, Tim, they're not an agent yeah. of a foreign government, and as you mentioned, they're probably far more appreciative of what they have than you and I are. That person should be a public servant, and I don't see why that person should be limited from running for president if they want to, so... I don't know if there's actually a way to change the Constitution to give a Congress and the state sentiment, but it would seem that if we're going to talk about immigration, Tim, we should probably also talk about these very limits that the Constitution has in place. Bill Whalen, this is a long way of you saying you want Arnold Schwarzenegger to be in the White House. So it's funny, there was a movement called Amend for Arnold uh, right after he won the recall election, and it fizzled. And yeah. it fizzled in part because people thought it was too politically aggressive on the part of Arnold supporters. Uh, but also, there just wasn't a lot of public excitement about it. But I do think, again, when you put it in the context of that boat person, Tim, somebody who yeah. fled a communist regime and just they love America, that's the person you want running your country at the end of the day. Look, I love Arnold Schwarzenegger. Um, I think he's a great American. And uh, I remember that movement at the time. And it made me think about it. Yes. And but to your point, when we go back and look at the um, Constitutional Convention, this was a really hot debate. Right. There, were, there were a lot of those founding fathers that thought no foreign born uh, person should be allowed to serve in the Congress and the Senate as a judge. They wanted to put all that restrictionist language in the Constitution. And it, were, it, it was a, the, the founding fathers like George Washington ironically, who said, you know, president, who said, no, think about this logically, we want America to be an asylum to the world. And secondly, almost everyone who fought is either a first generation or second generation immigrant in the 1776, you know, revolution. So, you know, there'd be negative consequences for this. So they got most of it right. Um, I think you make a good point about the presidency. They, they, that should not be limited to native born Americans, right. but I think it's a pretty big ask for an amendment to the constitution on, on that issue at this point. Although I think you're right in spirit. The other one, birthright citizenship is very interesting. Right. This, this is one that people wrongly claim is a ridiculous, unique feature of America. Well, right. you know, I wish it was because America is the strongest economy in the world in history. So the things that are unique about us, we should probably be preserving. But the fact is, birthright citizenship is common throughout the new world. Mm -hmm. It's the old world that, that tied citizenship to blood, not to soil. Right. Here we apply it to the soil. If you're born here, you're a citizen, that's sacrosanct. I think it needs to be defended to the hilt. And I'm really glad it's in the Constitution because I don't see any amendment uh, repealing that. Now, look, do people exploit it? Do, do, do poor women come from other countries on tourist visas and have babies here? They do, right. um, but it's it's hardly a crisis. And I think when you point to, uh, and I, I talk about France Hong in the book, France is a West Point graduate, came here as a two-year-old Vietnamese refugee. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's the children that grow up here that still have ties to their um, homelands. America is not a homeland, it's a nation. Right. Um, they become, I think, the, the best of Americans. And absolutely the pathway for France in particular should be open for him to become a governor or senator or congressman. Um, and, and maybe we can get Arnie to, to uh, support someone else who's an immigrant who could help overturn that amendment. 
So one thing our viewers should know about you is that you're a recovering candidate. You ran for Congress at one point in right. Ohio. Uh, I hope you've gotten that out of your system, my friend. <laughs> there are other ways to serve, Bill. Um, and, and I couldn't have written this book if I'd been in Congress. And I, I've actually, you know, you and I have had friends who serve in higher office. Right. Um, you know, the first thing they ask is, are you crazy? Right. You're, the, you're at the Hoover Institution. You're writing books. You're, you've got an important voice. Um, here you're going to sit in boring committees where people grandstand in front of cameras that no one's watching. So, no, I'm really happy with the way things have turned out. I wouldn't say it's out. Public service is not out of my system. But right. certainly I'm, I'm living right now in Palo Alto, like you, not back in my hometown of Columbus, Ohio. Right. So things happen for a reason. But uh, I mentioned this, Tim, because we do have an election coming up in November. Yes, Ukraine's going to be an issue. Yes, the economy is going to be an issue. Uh, yes, uh, education is going to be an issue. But a candidate is on the stump and he or she is asked about immigration. What would a good common sense answer be on what to do about immigration? Uh, simple. We want more legal immigration, zero illegal immigration. Mm -hmm. The, the assimil assimilation system matters. You know, citizenship, doing it the right way matters, makes us stronger. Illegal right. immigration and this culture of lawlessness, it, 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 it's not good for the country, but it's really not good for the border. I mean, it feeds criminal gangs. There's human trafficking, there's sex trafficking that that serves as a cover for. So the right answer is greater legal immigration, zero illegal immigration. That's a bipartisan slogan that I think will help candidates win. Okay, final question for you, Tim. What next on immigration? Are we waiting for a flashpoint, uh, like a migration surge at the border? Or do we just have to let other things cool down, like foreign policy crises and the economy? What, what's kind of the avenue for getting into this topic if you're if you're a member of Congress? So I, I'm, I think we play the long game here, right? Those of us who are national security hawks, and I'm one, that want America to win this century. That there's not a crisis. Um, that needs to be addressed right now because something's right. so broken. The, the, the situation at the border with Central America, I think, approaches that. But um, it's not a national security crisis, it's just sort of this lawlessness that needs to be addressed. But I think we're going to see a new type of alliance agreement um, and where America blurs the lines between what's an immigrant and what's an ally. Like right now, we've got limitations on British citizens, Japanese citizens who are you know, as close as allies can be, they can only come to America for a few months and then they have to go back. Right. At this point, I got to wonder why, right? If someone wants to come to the United States and rent an apartment and work but maintain their British citizenship, pay taxes here, um, contribute to an American company, we really need to rethink that aspect of it. So um, I think that will happen. There'll be a new type of alliance structure maybe it gets folded in with free trade agreements. So let's play the long game on this one, tidy up a little bit. But the biggest thing I learned in doing research for this book was how much America has gotten right for 200 years. We keep improving. Um, George Bush on this in 1990 was a real hero that, that deserves recognition. But let's keep the things that we're doing well that's probably the most important thing that we can do on immigration as a country as we look forward to winning this century. And the good thing about the long game, Tim, is you can keep writing and writing and writing about it, but hopefully not the Groundhog Day aspect of why it keeps failing year in and year out. <laughs> right. No, the next book, Bill, will be called Presidents and Immigrants. It will be more accessible, readable. It won't be an academic piece like this one. I want to focus on, I think it'll be the seven greatest American presidents on immigration and the three worst. And um, hat tip, uh, FDR, I would put up there as one of the worst. Really? Okay, well, I have to wait for them. I want to hear why, but I guess we'll Next wait book. for them. <laughs> Next book. Okay, Tim Kane, thanks for joining us today. You bet. My pleasure, Bill. The title again in Tim Gaines' excellent book is The Immigrant Superpower, How Brains, Brawn, and Bravery Made America Stronger. It's available online, folks. If you want to follow Tim on Twitter, you will find him there. His Twitter handle is at Timmer Kane. That is spelled T-I-M-M-E-R-K-A-N-E. -E. That's Timmer Kane, not to be confused with the senator from Virginia. That was a hell you went through in 2016, Tim Kane. You can also find Tim Kane through the Hoover Institution. He has a biography on the site as well. Go to www.hoover.org. You'll find it there. 
Also, sign up for Hoover's Daily Report, which delivers Tim's commentary and interviews to you when they happen. Very simple. Go to the website, go to where it says publications, click on that tab, and then go to where it says Daily Report, and you can subscribe to it. It comes to your inbox weekdays. Great way to keep in touch with the Hoover Institution and Tim Kaine. For the Hoover Institution, I'm Bill Whalen. Thanks for watching today. Thank you.